back so far we have discussed the basic concepts and in that you know we try to identify the arguments and we analyze the arguments in the sense that we evaluated the arguments and then we identified the uh, various kinds of arguments such as deductive and inductive argument and then we evaluated those argument in the sense that we we have seen when an ar when a deductive argument is valid when it is valid when it is sound and uh, in the case of inductive arguments we came to know about the strength of the argument and then when they are cogent and when they are uncogent etc you know so then uh, we presented a model for an argumentation which is due to a famous philosopher stephen tulmin and then we said that both inductive and deductive arguments can be fallacious when the deductive arguments are fallacious especially we will find it in the case of formal fallacies so inductive arguments can also be fallacious and then we discussed in greater detail with some examples about fallacies of weak induction etc so today we will be presenting um, aristotle in aristotle syllogistic logic basically uh, in this uh, we will be presenting uh, uh, something about categorical propositions and then these categorical propositions combined together will form some specific pattern of reasoning which are called as syllogisms then we will present aristotle theory of syllogisms which is presented way back in the year 3384 bc and 322 bc and then we will see with some kinds of rules uh, there are some rules with which you will come to know the validity of syllogisms and then at the end we will see the merits and demerits of aristotelian logic so as you see in this slide that uh, aristotelian theory of syllogism was presented long back in 384 bc and the next co the question that comes to us is why are we studying right at this moment you know so one of the interesting thing is is that aristotelian logics have dominated for more than 1900 years in fact to, to 2000 years so till the 19th century the beginning of the 19th or 20th century these logics were still used in all in in, uh, in various circumstances and all so uh, his theory of syllogism has had an unparalleled influence on in the history of western thought so he was the first to codify inferences into a system and to create rules for distinguishing correct and incorrect inferences and all for example if you say all men are mortal socrates is man socrates is mortal that seems to be a valid kind of inference and all and then not seems to be this is a valid inference and all so on the other hand if you say all men are mortal socrates is man socrates is not mortal so uh, that is a counter instance for this particular kind of thing that is an invalid kind of argument because the conclusion does not follow from the premises. So how to distinguish the first argument with the second argument so then Aristotle has presented is in his theory of syllogism he could codify inferences into a system and to create rules for distinguishing correct from incorrect inferences. So, so one of the interesting and important thing why we will be studying this Aristotelian logic simply because of this reason that syllogistic logic is logics are called as syllogistic logic in a sense that he uses a specific pattern of reasoning which is called as syllogism I will come to what I mean by syllogisms a little bit later uh, syllogistic logics remained as a paradigm for logical reasoning for more than 2000 years in all so right from 384 BC to till uh, the advent of modern logics which, which are due to Frege etc Frege Russell Whitehead etc so uh, till to that extent Aristotelian logics was still used and all even till to date uh, there are there are some logicians who are interested in uh, working in greater detail about Aristotelian logic and all so why after all this is the case that you know uh, we are still interested in Aristotelian syllogistic logics and all so it is considered to be an earliest formal study of logic and you can say that uh, it is an origin of formal logics and all so there is a difference between when you analyze the form of the argumentation then uh, we say that uh, form is what is considered to be the most important thing you know all men are mortal socrates is man socrates is mortal it exhibits some kind of valid form so that's why it is a valid argument in the same way all a's are b's all b's are c's so all a's are c's so this exhibits some kind of valid form so that is why it is a valid argument 
So in that sense uh, on the other hand uh, we need to analyze the content of the argument to, to know whether there is any mistake in the argumentation and all. For example this room is made up of atoms, atoms are invisible, so this room is invisible and all. So unless until you analyze the content of the paragraph, content of the argument there is no way in which you can find out what, uh, what is wrong with the, that particular kind of argument and all. So it is considered to be the beginning of formal logic after all this course is uh, about uh, mostly about the formal logic so it is better to study at least in some detail about Aristotelian uh, syllogistic logic because it is a starting point for formal logics. The same thing can be done later of course uh, we are going to see uh, in, the, in the case of uh, in, in predicate logics also we can do the same thing so, so but it has its own modern interpretation etc and all. So one of the beautiful or fantastic thing about uh, Aristotelian logic is, is that it is close to natural language not much uh, uh, jargons etc are used so it is not uh, there is not high technical stuff involved in this particular kind of thing it is very closer to natural language and all. Famous philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, he is the author of Critic of Pure Reason uh, uh, which, cons which is considered an important book in the, uh, in the philosophy western philosophy is uh, a 18th century philosopher he is of the view that Aristotle had discovered everything there was to know about logic and everything that historians are pointing about logic and all he is of the view that logic is complete in a in a sense that you know he has discussed most of the things and all because his contribution is enormous his contribution is not in not only in classical logics that we are uh, going to talk about that is uh, predicate and propositional logic but his contribution is also uh, also there in the in the area such as modal logics etc and all. So it is a starting point for understanding these uh, logics that we have that are available at this moment. So syllogistic logics one of the important features of this one is is that it is closer to natural language. So as the name suggests so syllogistic logic what do we mean by a syllogism. A syllogism is a logical argument where a quantified statement of a specific form usually it will be a, a conclusion which is inferred from two other quantified statements and all. So you should note that uh, we are already using some modern uh, concepts here Quantific, quantifiers are known only in the in only in the 19th century or 20th century at the end of the 19th century or in the 20th century but for the sake of understanding we are using this word quantifiers. Quantifiers are usually all it begins with uh, the statements begins with uh, all some none etc. So these are all uh, the statements which uh, starts with uh, quantifiers for example if you say all Greeks are humans in that all is said to be uh, a quantifier and all all humans are mortal therefore all Greeks are mortal. So this exhibits specific form all A's are B's all B's are C's so that is why all A's are C's. So a syllogism is a specific uh, kind of logical argument in which it is combined by two logic two categorical propositions I uh, will talk about what I mean by categorical propositions they are same as quantified statements and all. So uh, in, the, in the while studying the basic concepts we have seen that uh, a proposition is a sentence which can be spoken as either true or false suppose if I say shut the door or uh, dirty cockroach etc and all they are all not statements and all suppose if you ask what is your name they are all not propositions a proposition can be clearly spoken as either true or false but a categorical propositions they are also propositions which can be stated as either true or false but they are slightly different from that in the sense that all these statements begin with statements propositions etc they all begin with all some no etc sometimes you know you may not uh, come across all uh, etc and all instead of all you might find every each any all these things all these phrases are same as uh, that can be converted into uh, appropriate categorical propositions for example in the uh, for example if you say all Bo Bollywood movie stars are rich no students are Bollywood movie stars no students are rich. So uh, the thing is that uh, syllogism is a specific pattern of an argument in which 
you will find two categorical propositions are leading to another categorical proposition. So now the uh, how do we know that one categorical proposition which is which we we are calling it as a conclusion of the syllogistic uh, syllogism seems to follow uh, is following from the other categorical propositions and all. So in the case of all A's are B's all B's are C how do we know that all A's are C's follows that means how do we know that this argument is valid and all. So Aristotle has come up with a theory of syllogism in which uh, he has taken two categorical propositions into consideration and then from that he moved to another categorical proposition which we usually call it as the conclusion of the syllogism. So before there a little bit of background how did we how did Aristotle come up with uh, this theory of syllogism and all actually uh, in Aristotle has divided natural sciences into uh, three different categories based on what it is aiming at and all for example there are three branches of science one is aiming at truth that is considered to be theoretical in nature mathematics natural science theology theology used to be dominant in, uh, in those days so this is considered to be uh, one category or one branch of science so another is based on uh, the aim the purpose uh, is this the action part that is practical in a sense that ethics politics etc come under this particular kind of category and the other one is production that is art rhetoric etc and all they are basically productive in nature creativity is involved in this kind this particular kind of thing. So now these are uh, some of the branches of uh, sciences and all as you see clearly here I mean you will not see logic anywhere in these things and all. So where is logic in this particular kind of list and all Aristotle does not seem to have included it anywhere because he is of the view that it is there everywhere and all it might be there in uh, the first one second one even in the third one as well because it can be used as a tool uh, in uh, mathematics natural sciences ethics and even in art and rhetoric also we might use this particular kind of uh, I mean uh, logic can be used as some kind of uh, tool for all these things. So Aristotle has contrib contribution is enormous in varieties of branches etc and all has contributed in physics he contributed in metaphysics and all these things but as far as logic is concerned his works can be combined uh, together can be called as a different name which is called as Arganon. Arganon is a can some kind of instrument and all so Aristotle used the word logic and his term is used in, in the sense of analytic sense equivalent to some kind of verbal reasoning and he calls it uh, with the name Arganon. Arganon means some kind of instrument which is considered to be prerequisite for all kinds of rational enquiry. So that is the reason why in this case rational such kind of rational enquiry you will find it in all these disciplines and all I mean all these branches of science which Aristotle has classified. The recent classification may be a little bit different natural sciences and mathematics and then within natural sciences there are n number of uh, uh, different kinds of disciplines and all but Aristotle has classified in terms of the purpose that uh, it is trying to achieve if you are aiming at truth then it is called as mathematics natural sciences theologies etc theology action is ethics politics etc there are different classification which we have uh, the modern classification is slightly different from this particular kind of thing. So the, uh, the point here is, is that logic uh, you will find it everywhere because it is a justificatory tool uh, which can be used uh, uh, which is a prerequisite for all kinds of rational enquiry. So Aristotle's works in, on, in logic can be classified into six different uh, uh, there are six different works which are combined together uh, will form what he calls it as an organ. So this is a little bit important for us because we should know where what Aristotle has discussed and all. So these are the works the first one is category where uh, it is uh, the analysis of terms were discussed the topic of that category is the terms etc Aristotle logics are also called as term logics etc in that uh, in greater detail it was discussed and all second is de interpretation where the analysis of statements are made mainly categorical st statements etc how two categorical statements combine 
together and form another uh, leads to another kind of categorical statement that is that is what we find it in prior analytics where he has presented theory of inference and uh, post posterior analytics he has presented axiomatic structure of uh, science and in the topics they are all some of the works of Aristotle in topics he has presented a manual of argumentation analysis of argumentation what is a good argument what is a bad argument etc. In D. Sof Elange another work of Aristotle in which he has presented a manual on fallacies he discusses about fallacies and all it appears uh, it is clear that we will be focusing our attention on prior analytics where he has presented theory of inference and all we are not going into the details of all the other things and all mostly we will be studying about some of the uh, things related to categories de interpretation maybe prior analytics and all posterior analytics topics D Sophie they are all interesting they are linked with uh, uh, what we study in this uh, thing but our main purpose is to present Aristotle in the, uh, theory of syllogism and then there are rules to find out validity of syllogism and then we will discuss what are the limits of Aristotelian syllogistic logic. So prior analytics is the one uh, which we will be referring to to, uh, to continue further. So the, what are the basic units of Aristotelian syllogistic logic? So in the case of sentential logic the basic units are sentences uh, etc. So in this case uh, the basic units are terms. So what is a term? A term is a word or a group of words which expresses verbally a concept or simple it can be also called as a simple apprehension. You suppose if you say a term called heat and all it is corresponding to an object which is uh, in some kind of fire or something like that. So a term is considered to be a simple simplest unit into which a proposition and syllogism can be logically resolved and then you should note that not every word is uh, can be called as a term and all suppose if I say uh, Abrakdabra, Timbuktu etc and all they are not called as terms and all for not every word by itself is an expression of some kind of concept and all. so in that sense it is not called as a term. But there are some co-significant words which can also be called as some kind of terms they are co-significant words such as all but some because quickly all these things sometimes they can be adverbs sometimes they can be prepositions conjunctions articles articles such as the and a etc. For example if you say the term woman is an immediate expression of the concept of woman. So this, these are some of the things which can be which can come under the category of terms and all. So in the modern notation they represent some kind of sets or classes etc this we will talk about little bit later. So if a term is employed in two widely different senses and then we call it as this problem of equivocation and all if there is a shift in the meaning of the usage of the term then it leads to some kind of fallacy which is called as equivocation fallacy. So uh, for Aristotelian syllogistic logics the basic units are terms and terms combine and form some kind of categorical propositions and all. So what is a categorical preposition or a statement or statement prepositions that are used in the same way a categorical statement is a statement that relates two classes or categories. So there are two categories in which you know for example if you say all men are mortal men and mortal there are two categories. So this categorical statement relates these two classes and classes of men and classes of mortal beings you know. So this is the modern notation which we are uh, using it class or a set is a collection uh, a class is a collection of collection or set of things you know. For example some some 50 or 60 students constitutes so some some in uh, in some PHI 142 class or something like that a class consists of some 50 students etc. So what are the categorical prepositions they are uh, simply uh, they are they are the prepositions which begin with all some none etc and all all no some and all all the statements begin with this specific kind of uh, quantifier that is all no and some. So there are four kinds of categorical prepositions according to Aristotle they are like this each categorical preposition has a specific kind of structure it has subject and it has predicate. 
so predicate is attributed to the subject for example if you say all men are mortal men men are called men falls under the category of subject and then uh, being mortal is considered to be predicate of that particular kind of categorical statement so they can be like this a e i o all I mean this can be like this all s r p that means all dogs are animals that is a, a preposition a categorical proportion e preposition is no humans are donkeys suppose if you say some s r p that is some soldiers are cowards some soldiers are brave etc suppose o preposition is some s r not p some subatomic subatomic particles are not electrons so lots of mnemonics are used in understanding this particular kind of thing based on what the categorical proposition is trying to achieve the quality of the categorical proposition a and i propositions are affirmative and e and o propositions are negative so as this uh, mnemonic says that affirmo nego where you need to see the vowels that are there in the in these two words the first vowel is a that means a preposition and the second one second oval that you find is i a and i prepositions are affirmative that's why affirmo and e and o prepositions are negative you know. so with this you can say that you know suppose if you forgotten some somewhere or other which one is uh, affirmative and which one is uh, negative then you can use this mnemonic to find out uh, uh, a and i prepositions are affirmative and e and o prepositions are negative so what do we do with this categorical propositions and all categorical proposition in the sense that you know it is a proposition which it links to categories and all so not all the time you will find categorical propositions in the standard format sometimes it's used in a non standard format then what you need to do is you have to take some pain to convert these things into the standard format for example if you say saints are prayerful persons always they pray a lot you know saints always pray for some or for themselves for something like that so this is not in uh, the actual standard format where your categorical propositions begin with uh, all some no etc you know. so you have to convert it into the appropriate standard format that is if you convert it into the standard format it will become all saints are prayerful persons now this seems to be the standard format of a categorical proposition sometimes we need to take lot of pain to convert uh, this particular kind of things into categorical proposition. that might set some kind of limitation to this aristotelian logics but in most of the cases you can easily convert it convert from non standard format to the standard format for example if you say a standard chemical substance never is a phlogiston so it is talking about only one particular kind of chemical substance a substance a standard chemical substance never is a phlogiston so this can be translated as no standard chemical substance are phlogiston and simple things like a thief is caught is that is also not in uh, the standard format in the same way you know all men are mortal socrates is man socrates is mortal socrates is man is not in the standard format but you need to convert it into appropriate form and all there is someone x that x is a mortal and all suppose if you say a thief is caught i mean it's corresponding to only one thief and all at least one person is caught and all here yeah? so that's why we used some thief is caught and all you should not say that uh, all thieves are caught and all from this particular kind of thing or you cannot say that no thief is caught because it's saying a thief is caught and all so this translation will uh, sometimes be simple sometimes be complex sometimes it will be painful to translate it into standard format so once you convert it into the standard format things will be easier and all one of the important constituent of a syllogism is the categorical proposition so what are the parts of different parts of a categorical proposition we are trying to analyze what we mean by categorical proposition so first it begins with a quantifier and all the categorical proposition should begin with all no some etc so sometimes you may not find these things sometimes it may be instead of all you might find every each etc no sometimes can be used in never or something like that so some can be used in at least some of the things etc so every categorical proposition has a subject term 
all men are mortal that means men is considered to be a subject term and it is also a predicate term that is mortality mortality is attributed to the subject that is a predicate term and in addition to that we have something called a copula copula is a some kind of Latin word which means binding something here what it seems to be binding is two categories and all so all men are mortal men is one category another mortal beings is another category and what is binding them is what is called as a copula there are Latin words tying up fastening etc these are the meanings of copula so these are the words which you commonly use it as a copula to be was were will be etc all men are mortal are is considered to be a copula or in the same way um, all men are not mortal are not is considered to be a copula suppose if you say water boils at 144 degrees centigrade and all 104 degrees centigrade so water yes that is the subject is water and then water is such that it boils at 104 degrees centigrade and then boils at that that it boils at 104 degrees is a predicate and water yes is what is called as a subject so every categorical preposition has a subject and predicate and it has a copula as well for example the categorical prepositions whales breathe I mean this is not in a standard format and all suppose if you say whales breathe it can be written as it is talking about the whole class of whales and all so that is why we can write it as all whales are breathing things so then you know your seems to be converting this non-standard format whales breathe into the standard format. So these are uh, you can analyze categorical proposition in this particular way. So a categorical proposition is defined as a statement which unites two terms by verb, verb which is called as a copula. And those things which are uh, there are some kind of hypothetical propositions and all if p then q kind of things it has non-verb copula and all. We will go into the details of this thing when we uh, while we are talking about uh, uh, limitations of uh, Aristotelian logics why it fails for some hypothetical propositions why it is not easy to infer A in place B and A and from that B follows and all using Aristotelian logics because it is difficult to convert sometimes in these propositions into uh, the actual uh, categorical propositions. So, so categorical propositions can further be divided into uh, different, uh, different uh, categories can be further divided into singular in a sense that suppose if you, if you are referring to a singular class of objects then it, it is called a singular suppose if you say this man is a liar Socrates is mortal or something like that you know this doctor uh, does not uh, give good medicine all these things comes under singular term singular categorical purpose is referring to only one particular object particular things are uh, like this some men are selfish some includes maybe at least one and all or it may be more also 10 people 15 20 or maybe 30 also but at least one person is selfish and all you can say that some men are selfish or you can say not all men are cowards etc and universal universal in the sense every man is fallible I mean everyone makes mistakes etc then it is referring to the entire class of human beings and all so it is an universal categorical preposition. So it's it, all these things are based on the extension of subject term and all. Subject term in every man uh, is fallible is man. So this man is referring to all the class of. Uh, I mean, man is in all the class of every, every man is fallible means fallibility is uh, attributed to a whole class of men and all. So that's why it is called as a universal proposition. And there are some other kinds of proposition which poses problem for us. That is, in translating it into the standard format they are indefinite categorical propositions suppose if you say woman is fickle men are selfish beauty is truth all these things comes under indefinite kind of uh, categorical propositions mostly we will use singular particular universal categorical propositions. So this kind of distinction is based on the extension of subject term it is very difficult to say in the case of indefinite uh, uh, categorical propositions uh, the extension of the subject terminal 
So, based on uh, the quality categorical proposition will also have uh, subject and predicate and copula these are the things which we have in addition to that every categorical proposition is having some kind of quality as well. Every categorical statement is a quality and it can be that quality can be affirmative or negative in the case of uh, the last uh, few slides we just said that affirmo nego a proposition and I propositions are affirmative and uh, O proposition and E propositions are negative. If a statement affirms that one class is wholly or partly partially included in another class then the statements quality is what is called as affirmative. If a statement denies that one class is wholly or part partially included in another its quality is called as negative. So it depends upon whether or not one particular kind of class is included in other class partially or fully and all based on that we have uh, different kind of things affirmative and negative categorical propositions. So these are the things which we have been talking about a proposition simply all SRP and the quantity is universal because all SRP that means it is referring to the whole class so that is why it is a universal proposition a and e are universal categorical propositions I and O are particular propositions so and the quality of A and E A and O A and I are affirmative whereas E and O are negative and all here somewhat it is not written properly but so usually A proposition and I proposition are considered to be affirmative and all men are mortal some men are mortal so you are affirming something so if you suppose if you say no men are mortal you are negating this uh, particular kind of thing that means there is no one who is considered to be mortal and all in that particular kind of case some men are not, not mortal means at least there is one who is not considered to be mortal. So these uh, first we are analyzing the categorical propositions and then we will make use of it in uh, forming the rules uh, in, in we will we'll try to understand the rules of syllogism etc little bit later. So uh, a proposition can be represented as all S is P or no S or P etc. So there are very uh, there, there are some variants of A which are not in the standard format whenever you come across these kinds of uh, categorical propositions you need to translate it into all S or P you know. for example if you have every S is a P every IITK student is an intelligent person so suppose if you say that thing you can say all IITK students are intelligent each S is P or if you come across any S is a P then also you can translate it into all S is P if anything is an S and that is also P for example if you say all cats are animals if anything is in a cat then it has to be an animal also. So things are S only if there are P or only P or S all these things can be translated into the standard form as all S or P in the same way in the case of E. Uh, you do not find uh, you know, all the time all the time you do not come across uh, no SRP etc and all but sometimes it will be used in a different sense such as nothing that is an S is a P which is same as no S is P I think is S only if it is not P or if anything is an S then it is not P all cats are dogs for example no cat is a dog if anything is a cat it cannot be dog enough in the same way nothing is an S unless it is not P all these things comes under the same thing the translation of that one is uh, nothing but uh, no S is P and the same way I and O propositions which you come across uh, sometimes they may not be in the standard format uh, I proposition can simply be represented as some S or P and it can also be at least one S is P there exists an S that is P uh, if you say some something is both S and P and there is an S that is not P etc all these things comes under the I proposition only that is some S or P some S are not P is like this at least one S which is not P and all not all S are P that means some which are not P only not every S is P and something is an S but it is not P and there is an S that is not P all these things can be safe translated into an O proposition which are which does not seem to be in the standard format but non standard forms can be translated into the standard 
format. How to interpret these categorical propositions? So far, we have seen A, E, I, and O. We classified it according to the quality, and we said A and I propositions are affirmative, and E and O propositions are negative, etc. So, how to represent it in terms of uh, this is a modern notation sets and all sets are a collection of uh, well defined things and all uh, which can be distinguished and all. So, A, E, I, and O may be interpreted as assertions about sets, sets are what classes or collection a group or universe etc all these things are important for defining the set and a relation between sets and all sets are well defined collection of distinguishable and individual things and all set of cats, set of animals etc, set of dogs etc where it consists of only dogs and all. So, this is the modern notation that we can use we can represent this categorical propositions in this particular way and then I will try to draw a diagram to show that uh, in the modern notation we can represent this A, E, I and O in a certain way. So, uh, when we say that one set is included in the other one, one set is included in the other set if the members of the first set are also the members of the second set and all that is the case then you can say that A is included in B usually you represent it as A is a subset of B. One set for example that is uh, all men are mortal, mortality is uh, there included in uh, some kind of all men and all. So one set is excluded from another set if two sets have no common members and all no cats or dogs. So cats and dogs are different entities. So this is quite simple to understand this particular kind of thing they are disjoint kind of sets and all there is no connection between these things and uh, instead of uh, being fully included or fully excluded from each another one can also have partial inclusion and all one set is partially included in another one if some members of the first set are also members of the second set some means at least one is uh, there it is good enough for us to say that it is partially included in the other set. In the same way one set is partially excluded from the other set if some members of the first set are also not the members of the second set. So based on this thing uh, the recent notation uh, John Venn has come up with uh, Venn diagrams uh, usually we say picture says 1000 words and all. So let us try to represent these uh, categorical propositions with uh, uh, Venn diagrams and then uh, we try to see in what sense they are different from each other. So when has used uh, this particular kind of diagrams which are very intuitive and uh, which uh, uh, using these diagrams one can show whether a syllogism is valid or invalid. So let us uh, talk a little bit about when diagram our uh, interest is not in analyzing this uh, when diagrams uh, but you know we are trying to represent uh, this particular kind of categorical propositions in terms of uh, when diagrams. So it is uh, like this. So when has used uh, this particular kind of classes, uh, any two classes when they intersect with each other, then it will be like this A and B. So now we are trying to talk about A, E, I, and O using this uh, when diagram. usually a picture says 1000 words and if you if you know about these things with the help of diagrams then things will make will give us uh, make our life simpler and all. So it has uh, four portions first one is this second third and there is someone outside this one usually we draw like this. So this is an universal set usually you know it is uh, excluded and all so we do not take into consideration this uh, box and all. So in general we do not write this particular kind of thing. So that means you know it is bounded by some kind of domain and all. So which we do not state it explicitly here. Uh, so in terms of set theoretic notation uh, suppose if you have this particular kind of thing then what you say is uh, this first portion uh, this first we will talk about the second portion second one is nothing but A intersection B and then it is uh, the first portion is A intersection B complement 
and the third one is k intersects section B and then the fourth one is A bar and B bar. So, these are some of the things which are there in this particular kind of thing. So, first one is A intersection B because uh, for example, if you say all men are mortal then uh, the first one A is referring to men and B is referring to mortality these are the two categories which we are trying to relate with the help of uh, uh, some kind of uh, Venn diagrams you know. So, this portion referring to A intersection uh, so this portion is referring to A intersection B and this is this particular kind of portion till here 1. So, till here only that is referring to A intersection B bar that means what it says is A intersection B bar is what is called as emptiness and all emptiness is the one which we are shading it in this particular kind of way. So, in the same way if you take A bar and intersection B bar and all if that is an empty set then you have to shade this particular kind of portion 3 needs to be shaded and all. So, in the same way uh, A complement and uh, B complement if that is an empty set then that is referring to the fourth one there is nothing which is uh, this, this is disjoint from all these things and all. So, based on this particular kind of idea we can draw A, E, I and O in this particular way. So, So, the first one A preposition can be this is A preposition which is shown as this particular kind of thing. So, since all S are P means S intersection uh, all S are P means S intersection P should be empty and all it should be an empty set. So, what is S intersection P bar this is S and this will be the subject term and predicate term and this is the thing which is uh, considered to be this S intersection P prime. So, that has to be empty and then we we shaded this particular kind of portion and all. So, that is what is referring to all S or B all cats are animals means this particular kind of thing. So, there cannot be a, a thing which is considered to be cat uh, and complement of this one is 1 minus uh, p. So, that intersection should should be empty you know. So, that is referring to all s r p. So, in the same way uh, this is a preposition and uh, i preposition is uh, uh, like this. is I A this is what is called as O preposition and then you have I preposition in this sense. So, this is called as I preposition. So, you put some kind of dot here in between this particular kind of thing this uh, shows that there is at least one x which is s and which is p and all some cats are uh, some dogs bark and all that means if there is at least one dog which is barking and all which is a cat and which also barks and all and that will serve your purpose and all. you might ask uh, 100 dogs bark etcetera and all but what is satisfied by this particular kind of thing that some srp is this particular kind of thing. So, this whole class is S and this is P some X or Y you need to put one particular kind of cross in the in this area you know. So, this is what is called as I preposition and and so this is called as one second. So, now this is called as E preposition I am sorry for this. So uh, this is a E preposition. So, in which this is again same thing or uh, no S is P and all. So, if you if 
if you shade this particular kind of portion then uh, this will be like this S intersection P is empty in all. So if that is the case then it is called as no S or P for example if you say no cats or dogs so that means uh, cats if you take the intersection of cats and dogs that should be an empty set that means there should not be any particular kind of element which should be there in that particular kind of set these sets are considered to be distinct collection of objects which are arranged in a certain way. So A, E, I and what this is called as O some S are not P so this is represented in this particular kind of set. So there should be at least one X which is not in the P and O that means you need to put here you should not put this star here that makes it all P are not S uh, some P's are not S and all so that is not we are trying to talk about some S are not P means this particular kind of thing so you should put some star in this particular kind of thing so so what is that we have done we have tried to represent uh, categorical propositions with the help of some diagrams and all so now what we are going to see is uh, some kind of uh, square of opposition which is considered to be most important in this particular kind of thing. So you have A proposition and E proposition and I proposition and O proposition why I have mentioned this, mentioned this in this particular way we are going to see in the table the diagonals in particular the direct arrows are also important so these diagonals are contradictory to each other contradictory. contradictory to each other and then uh, these are these are contrary to each other so I will talk about what I mean what we mean by contrary contradictory and uh, this is what is called as sub contrary sub contrary and this is what is called as implies that means a proposition implies I proposition in some sense you know. so and thus this is also what is called as implication you know. from no SR uh, no SRP we can derive some SR not P you know no cats or dogs I mean some cats are not dogs you know. so why I am mentioning this particular kind of thing because I want to show that A proposition is contradictory to O proposition and E proposition is contradictory to I proposition for example if you say no cats are dogs then suppose if you come up with a proposition in which some cats are dogs that means at least one cat is a dog and all then it is contradicting this no cats are dogs in the same way in this particular kind of case all men are mortal if we can come up with the one particular case in which some men are mo not mortal at least one person is there is good enough to show that this is uh, false and all so that is why in this particular kind of sense these two are diagonals are contradicted to each other and then we will talk about what we mean by contrary and sub contrary and all so, so these, these are some of the relations which we will uh, commonly come across so why I am drawing this diagram this diagram tells us lots of things and all so we will come to know how these categorical propositions are related to each other so if you allow for this particular kind of thing from A you infer I and all then you call it this particular kind of thing as immediate inference and all so immediate inferences are those kinds of inferences in which the conclusion follows from only one particular kind of categorical proposition so uh, suppose if you this if you say that A implies I and all for example if you say all men are mortal from that you infer some men are mortal uh, to in traditional logic that particular kind of inference is allowed so in the same way suppose if you say no cats are dogs from that if you say some cats are not dogs and that is also called as another kind of inference and all and then these two are contradictory to each other 
So, we will get into the details of uh, uh, this one little bit later when I discuss about uh, 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 the relation between A, E, I and O in greater detail. So, what we have done is uh, we have represented the categorical propositions in terms of uh, some kind of diagrams and all. So, now how do we know that uh, a particular thing is distributed and particular term is not distributed and all. So, this is the book which we, we are following Patrick Hurley concise introduction to logic in 194 page. So, it is like this that if a, if a certain term is distributed in a proposition this simply means that the proposition says something about every member of the class that the term is designating in all. If it is not talking about then every member of the class then the term is said to be undistributed and all. If a term is undistributed the proposition does not say something about every member of the class and all. So, the term refers to every member of the set it designates and all. All soldiers are brave that means braveness is referring to all the soldiers and all it is distributed amongst all the soldiers and all. So, here braveness refers to the whole class of soldiers but in not in the vice versa and all. For example, if you say all brave people are so soldiers and all. So, that is not all soldiers are brave is totally different from all brave people are soldiers and all. Braveness here is a, is a term refers to the whole class of soldiers. For example, if you say no reptiles are warm blooded uh, things and all. So, any reptile that uh, any reptile at all is not a warm blooded thing and there are no warm blooded things that are reptiles and all. So, in both cases subject and predicate are distributed here. So, what is the subject here reptiles uh, and warm bloodedness is a predicate reptiles are referring to whole class of warm blooded beings and the same way warm blooded beings uh, are referring to the whole of reptiles and all. So, uh, this is uh, uh, what is called as uh, distributed uh, distributiveness and all if it is referring to the whole class uh, proposition is say something about every member of the class that the term denotes then it is called as distributed and if it is referring to only something about every member of the class it is called as undistributed and all. So, why are, why are we talking about this uh, distribution and undistribution how do we know that uh, what proposition in uh, a proposition whether the subject is distributed or predicate is distributed etcetera and all. So, there are a few mnemonics that we have used earlier affirmo nego that tells us that a and uh, i propositions are affirmative and e and o propositions are negative. And then there are other propositions in which uh, you can talk about this concept of distribution and this is like this unprecedented unprepared students never pass this is only for our understanding and then we need to find out uh, the ovals here. So, in the first thing u stands for universal propositions and s stands for subject n stands for uh, neither of them uh, p means uh, and n stands for negative propositions categorical propositions p stands for predicate. So, universal propositions distributes only subject and uh, uh, negative propositions distribute predicate that is not good enough and is not giving us uh, full details of uh, what can in what in, in a categorical proposition what term is distributed and all. So, the best thing would be this particular kind of thing any student earning B's is not on probation. Now, we need to look into the ovals here the first letter is A and immediately followed by that S is there that means A proposition distributes subject. Now, that is the first uh, two words and all which is with which you can find out that A proposition distributes subject and E proposition distributes B means both and I proposition uh, distributes neither some men are mortal means uh, no term is distributed in that particular kind of thing and O proposition distributes predicate that means E proposition distributes both of them both subject and predicate and O proposition distributes only P and all this is the way in which you know in ancient past they have used lots of mnemonics to identify uh, uh, all these shortcuts and all are hidden in this particular kind of thing. We are going to see some more mnemonics a uh, uh, little bit later. So, so far we have defined what is uh, uh, categorical uh, syllogism now 
we have seen what is a categorical proposition, what it consists, uh, what it consists of, etc., and all. How to represent it in terms of diagrams, etc., and all, so that you'll, uh, we can easily understand these things, uh, etc., and all. So now coming back to a specific pattern of argument in which you will find only categorical propositions. If it is not in standard format, you need to convert it in, into a standard format. So a categorical syllogism is a deductive argument having a sequence of three and only three categorical propositions. That means two will serve as premises, another one will serve as a conclusion. Such that three and only three terms appear in a sequence of statements. Each term appearing in exactly two propositions in all. So these are some of the things which you will find it in categorical propositions. So you will find subject term, predicate term, and the middle term in all. So the way in which these terms of syllogisms are arranged is what is called as figure of that particular kind of syllogism. So in this uh, uh, lecture what we have done is simply is that uh, uh, we are trying to talk about Aristotelian syllogistic logics, uh, Aristotelian syllogistic logics what is, the, what is considered to be important is the syllogism, a syllogism consists of categorical propositions and all. So in this lecture we analyzed what we mean by categorical propositions and we represented these categorical propositions in terms of uh, we have given some kind of diag diagrammatic representation which is due to John Wen uh, is a mathematician and all with which you know uh, how this A, E, I and O propositions are related uh, is the one which we have discussed and we have said that A and E propositions uh, A and uh, O propositions are contradicted to each other, I and O propositions are contradicted to each other and then uh, we have also said that uh, uh, sometimes you know from A proposition you can infer I proposition and in the same way E proposition you can infer I proposition and all in a some limited kind of sense. In the next lecture we will be talking about uh, Aristotelian actual theory of syllogism and then we will try to find out some kind of rules for the validity of syllogisms and all. So we will continue with the validity of syllogisms in the next lecture.